Okay. We're all here. Picking up where we left off last class period, we talked a little bit about transformers. It wasn't the official transformer section yet when we talked about it, but it was introduced. So we're going to spend a little time talking about generators and transformers and then move into waves. So generators, the purpose of a generator is to generate electricity. And you can't tell from this design. I, I have exactly this design. I believe these are what they used to use in the old um, crank telephones. Now I know to you guys, the rotary dial telephones are the old style. But you know, back in my grandparents' day, they had a little crank. And what that crank did is it sent power down the line to sell, tell somebody at switching station, hey, there's somebody at this phone. And then they would connect wires and whatnot. So this here is a little generator. Now how the generator works, if you look at this, it looks pretty much like a motor did. Right, the motor we had magnets, these here are magnets. And inside, you can't see, but there's a coil that rotates inside, just like a motor. So you have a coil inside, and then you have magnets, so let me put... If that's the north side of the magnet and this is the south side of the magnet, which direction do magnetic field lines point? Out of blank and into blank. By the way, it's 50 50, and I appreciate taking the shot. It's going to go out of north and into south, so the magnetic field's like this. Now, what's different for a generator compared to a motor? For a motor, how did you make that motor run? You did what? How did we turn it into a magnet? That's correct. How did we do it? Okay, we passed current through it, and it made that coil behave like a magnet. And so if we had it in the orientation like I've shown, let's say north is straight up because of putting the current through it, then I would have a torque to make the magnet align with the external magnetic field, and it would rotate. For a generator... We do things just the opposite. We manually rotate the coil. So we make this coil rotate. That's what the little handle here is for. And when you make it rotate, one way to think about what's happening is I have a wire that's moving in a magnetic field. Well, we learned the force on a charge that is moving in a magnetic field is QVB. So there's going to be force on the charge in that wire when you make the wire move in the magnetic field. And if you put a force on the charge, the charge is going to naturally respond by accelerating, right? Newton's second law. So if that charge starts moving, what have you created? A current. And that's what the generator's purpose is, to generate that current. So that's one way of looking at it. Another way of looking at it is to look at Faraday's law of induction. Faraday said that the induced voltage is this minus sign here I don't think was shown before. So we saw this equation, but I didn't have the minus sign. The reason for the minus sign is basically to remind you of Lentz's law. So let's look at all of these things. And once we are remembering what all these things are, then I'll move on. So starting with N. What does the N stand for? The number of coils. I don't know if that's what you're saying as well. It's the number of coils. N for number. This capital Greek phi, subscript B. That's the hardest one of the things in this equation. It's the magnetic flux. <clears throat> 
phi is the, the F sound, so that's where they have phi for the symbol. Flux is the amount of magnetic field going through the surface. So for instance, if you look at my picture right now, the coil is flat, so there's no magnetic field going through the surface, hence the flux is zero. But if I rotate that coil by 90 degrees, then I'll have a fair amount of magnetic field going through the coil. The magnetic flux, whoops, obviously my pin is not writing where I think it is. is equal to the magnetic field parallel to the area of my surface. So if I rotate 90 degrees, then that magnetic field is going to be going right through the area, and I would have a maximum value. The units, remember, of magnetic flux were Weber's. I told you that was super important. Even though it's only 1B and it's got the ER on there, it's still the idea. Okay, now let's go to easy. What is T? So what this is saying is that the magnetic, or the voltage that's going to be created by the generator is equal to minus sign for direction purposes only, the number of coils times the rate at which the flux is changing. So if I turn that crank faster, it's going to change quicker, and thus it'll produce a higher voltage. Turn it slower, and it'll produce a lower voltage. And if I start with it flat like this, the first 90 degrees, the flux is increasing. But then the next 90 degrees, the flux is, in fact, the next 180 degrees, the flux is decreasing, going to zero and then to a negative value. And then I keep going and the flux increases again. So the flux is going to increase, decrease, increase, decrease as you rotate that. So if you rotate it, the actual voltage you get is a sine wave. So this is the flux here. This is the voltage down below the EMF. Green we decide doesn't work, I'm sorry. EMF means electromotive force. It's an incorrect term. People used to think that batteries put a force on charge to make the charge move, and so they called it an EMF. It's, it's a... Incorrect term, but they still use it. So that is the voltage induced. Same thing. So this here starts at maximum. If you start at maximum, technically, yeah, that's a cosine wave. So I write cosine of omega t, where we will learn about omega coming up when we talk about waves. But I have something that is fluctuating with the sinusoidal pattern. Cosines and sines are both sinusoidal. Sine, cosine, both sine and them. So that generator makes a voltage that goes positive, negative, positive, negative. What do we call voltage that goes positive, negative, positive, negative? What we don't call is constant. Back and forth, back and forth. Variation. What? Variation. Okay, it is varying, and so we could say it's a varying voltage. The term that we commonly use is alternating, because it's going between positive and negative. So we call it, and we say alternating current, because the current is going to be changing direction as well. So the generator produces an alternating current that's sinusoidal. So I have power that's coming out of the wall here. What's the source of this power? Electrical power. By the way, it's only power if I actually have it go through me and use energy per time, right? Because power is the rate at which energy is used. What's the source of that? Where does it come from? From what? Okay, from a power plant. What types of power plants do we use? Okay, nuclear, you said coal? Yeah, coal, turbine. Okay. Almost all of them, in fact, pretty much all of them, 
Sorry, I'm behind you now. The power plants pretty much always use a turbine. What is that turbine? It's a generator just like this. So the power that's coming out of there was generated from a turbine like this. Now there are different types of power plants. Let's take the, a coal power plant. What do you do? You burn coal to make stuff hot and you boil water. And when you boil the water, the pressure goes way up. And you use that pressure to move the turbine, to make it rotate. And then that's connected to a generator. That's a heat engine, right? You heat up the water and so on. Well, instead of coal, you could use natural gas. But you're still going to boil water and make the turbine turn. Or you could use nuclear power. They use nuclear power to make the water hot so that it turns to steam. And it still runs a turbine and it's a steam generator. So almost all of our power is from steam generators. Not all of it though. If you have a hydroelectric plant, then you have water up here has gravitational potential energy. You let it fall down and go through a turbine, it converted that gravitational potential energy into kinetic energy as it's falling down, goes through the turbine, that kinetic energy turns the turbine, and then you have a generator that generates the electricity. So that one's not a standard heat engine because it's not hot to cold, unless you want to think of it in a really global sense, like, okay, so it gets hot, water evaporates and goes up in the sky, and then it rains and can fall somewhere higher, right? That's kind of going overboard. So generators are what we use for all of our power, regardless of which type of power plant it's coming from. I don't know why I'm sitting so far back. What's the voltage coming out of a plug? Okay, like 120. It depends on where you are and what time of day, actually. The, the standard is 120 volts. But during periods of high consumption, they might go down to 110 volts. And so sometimes they'll say 115 volts just to say, okay, that's the average value between the maximum and minimum. When there's higher power demand, they lower the voltage because that's going to lower the current, and that's the total power that's consumed, so they can spread it out to more people. But of course, what does that mean? Well, that means things like your incandescent light bulbs don't burn as brightly during those high demand times when they lower the voltage. Okay, but it's 120 to 110 volts. I talked about this before. You have a sine wave like this. What's the average for that sine wave? The average is zero. So when we say it's 120 volts, we're not talking about the average voltage. So what are we talking about then? You would think the peak, but it's not for a, a simple reason. The peak here turns out to be about 170 volts down to minus 170 volts. So it's not the peak either. That seems to be the obvious answer. That's the one I certainly would have answered when, once you said average can't be it. And so it's the root mean squared. The actual calculation is the voltage RMS, if it's sinusoidal, is square root of 2 times the voltage peak. And so if we take 120 volts is equal to square root of 2. Um, whoops, it's not square root of 2, it's 1 over square root of 2. I put them in the wrong position. I suddenly realized this is going to give me a number that's smaller instead of bigger. Then solving that for V peak, V peak is equal to 120 volts times the square root of 2. And somebody have a calculator to actually. <laughs> Sometimes it simply doesn't work for me to pull my calculator up. And now it's one of those times. I have a nifty calculator. Just can't use it.
What is it? 169.7. Okay, 169.7 volts. So that's where I got the 170 from. So in our houses, that's what we're using. That's not what comes from the power plant. The power plant produces the voltage, and they produce a much higher voltage to go through the transmission lines. Their generators may produce some, I, I don't know what voltage they actually produce, but then they use a transformer. So here's a transformer. Oh, green, perfect. There's an example of transformer. There's an example of transformer. And here's an example of transformer. They use transformers to adjust the voltage up and down. So transformers are an important part of our electrical distribution system. And so we talked about transformers before. I mentioned you put a changing voltage in and you get a changing voltage out. Why? If I have a current that goes through a coil, what does that create? Say the current's going like this. So it's doing loops around that iron. If the current's doing that, what's it creating inside of the coil? It's creating a magnetic field. So that current is creating a magnetic field and using our right hand rule, the way this works is just wrap your fingers the way the current goes in the coil. Your thumb points the direction of the magnetic field in the center. So the magnetic field is going like this. Remember I talked about this before. We use a nice iron core so that that makes the magnetic field really strong. Increase it by a factor of around 1,000 and keeps it all within the iron so you don't lose energy going other places. Now, if I had a constant magnetic field in the second core, remember my voltage induced is equal to minus N change in magnetic flux divided by change in time. If the magnetic field is constant, what do I have for my change in magnetic flux divided by change in time? Remember, what is magnetic flux? You have to think back a few slides. How much the magnetic field is passing through? Yeah, it's how much magnetic field is passing through. So in this picture, I have the red magnetic field passing through the area of that coil. If the magnetic field is constant, then how much is that changing with time? It's not. And so if the magnetic field is constant, I'll have the induced is zero. So if I connect this to a battery, batteries have constant voltage, constant current, I'll get nothing out because I don't have the changing magnetic field. But if I have a sinusoidal voltage in, I'm going to have a sinusoidal current, which means my magnetic field is going to be strong up, strong down, strong up, strong down. It'll be going back and forth, which will induce a voltage on the output side. One of the important things about these, I mentioned it before, there is no electrical connection between the primary side and the secondary side. There's coupling with the magnetic field, but there's no wire that goes from the input side to the output side. This allows you to isolate things. That is, you can have something that's grounded on the left-hand side. It can have this side connected to the ground, and just I'm going positive, negative on top. And then over here, there is no ground assigned. So I could put ground anywhere I want. I could put ground in the middle of this resistor, and it's still perfectly legitimate because there's no electrical connection between the two sides. Uh, I actually didn't want to do that. <laughs> so the output voltage, important equation for you is this equation. Well, these are the same equation, just solved for different variables. That's the equation for a transformer. The number of turns in the primary divide, or I didn't, you can put it the other way, you can put the voltage in the primary divided by the number of turns in the primary is equal to the voltage in the secondary 
divide by the number of turns in the secondary if V1 is what? Zero. Not zero. Uh, I mean, it would be true if it's zero. Yeah. But there's a special condition that you have to have for the transformer to work. What was that? Remember I said a battery won't work? Yeah, it has to be alternating. So if V1 is alternating, if it's constant, this equation is not correct. But if it's alternating, it is. And so you can take this to solve for V2 as is done in the lower equation as a function of V1. So why would we use this? I'm sure many of us have been to countries that don't use... 120 volts. How many people went to a country that doesn't use 120 volts? One, two, three. Only three. Well, and me, four. So a couple years ago, I went with the honors group to Hong Kong and Malaysia. And in Hong Kong, they used 220 volts. I bring my phone and I want to charge my phone. What do I do? I need an adapter that's going to take it from the 220 output to the 110 or 120 that I want. So what I need is a transformer. And so we went to a market there in Hong Kong, and you know, for a buck you could buy a little transformer that transforms the voltage. Actually, it turned out that most of your charging blocks for your phones will work on 110 or 220. They they detect inside and they work either way. But I didn't know that at first. Um, so you get a transformer to step the voltage down. When I was in college, we went on a choir tour to England. And one of my classmates, she bought herself a transformer, but it was an expensive kind where you could plug in different ratios of turns. So you could go to a country that's 220, and put in this, and it would work for 110, go to another country, and put in a different one. And she had the wrong one in. She went to dry her hair. Turns on the blow dryer. Whee! Goes really fast until it starts melting and, and burns wires. Why? <laughs> because she plugged her 110 into a 220 outlet, basically. And so the 220 was putting twice as much current through as it was designed for and burned it up, which we thought was hilarious. So transformers, definitely more than meets the eye, right? Now, I think it's a quicker question. Yep. So I have to move forward on the uh, list before you can answer. Can a transformer be used as shown? Okay, you can answer now. Okay, we had six yes, three no. None that said it's impossible to tell. Now I'm going to write our equation and discuss with the people around you your answer. I haven't done a discussion for a while. Get through. That's the goal here, because they might have good ideas. Not, not this morning, but not today. <laughs> 
Okay, let's give this a second shot. Okay, this is an example where it worked. All but one person said no after discussion. So, <laughs> you said they were help or useless to you. Did you have a good reason for that? <laughs> well, number one, we all had the same answer, and number two, oh. we all guessed the same answer. So. <laughs> You all had the same answer that you had to have all been wrong the first time. Why did you change? <laughs> okay, I, I know that I heard Tyler explain it correctly. Why is the correct answer no? It won't work. Because it's not alternating current. Because it's not alternating current. Right, a battery is DC. It puts out a constant voltage. It's going to make a magnetic field. There will be a magnetic flux, but it won't be changing. And you have to have it changing. Now, the second way to look at this might have been if you thought maybe it was going to step it down. So if I solve for delta V2, I can look here and just count the loops. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. If it was AC, it would have stepped it up because I have 7 to 3 for the ratio of the number of turns in the secondary to the number of turns in the primary. But the fact that it was DC meant that it had to be no. Our power distribution uses high voltages and so it uses transformers to move the voltage up and down. So going across the country, you might have 230,000 volts in those wires. Quite clearly, were you to grab onto one of those wires and have your foot anywhere close to something that's grounded, it would end you. So that would be bad. So why do they do that? Why do they put in voltages that are so unsafe for humans? You lose a lot as it's traveling, but the amount you lose is proportional to the current squared. Right? You have a wire with a fixed resistance R, and so we calculate the power loss proportional to the current squared. For the same power delivered, if I raise the voltage, I can lower the current. And so by lowering or by raising the voltage and lowering the current, if you raise the voltage to 230,000, that's about 2,000 times more voltage than you have at your home, which means the current for getting the same amount of power delivered is 1 2,000th. And if you square 1 over 2,000, that's 1 over 4 million. So you're cutting the power loss by 1 divided by 4 million, or well, by 4 million, by using that high voltage. That makes a lot of sense, doesn't it? It really makes good sense to have the high voltage because you're cutting the power loss in the delivery lines by 4 million. But you have to worry about safety. And people who work on high power lines, well, they're crazy, but they do things like they wear a suit that's all conducting. So if it's all conducting, they touch the wire, and the electricity goes through their suit instead of through their body. And then they have their shoes actually connected to a high voltage as well. So they're already at high voltage. As long as they touch the high voltage, there's no problem because the difference is zero. But if they touch ground, that will end them. So it's a, an opposite problem. But to me, that's pretty scary.
So we use transformers to transform the voltages up and down. So 230,000 going across the country, about 7,200 going around our cities, and then you have the little you know, power pole that has a transform rod to bring it down to the, well, it's 120 and they're opposite, so you get 240 total of going into our house. So we step the voltages down to make them safer, but still, that's not a very safe voltage, as I said. If I'm all dry skinned, it's safe. If I'm wet in the bathtub, it's not safe. And good rule of thumb, when should you shock yourself? Yeah, never, right? Never. Good rule of thumb right there. Uh, the last statement here I find interesting. This comes from the textbook. They sometimes use direct current for transmitting over long distances because direct current doesn't create electromagnetic waves. Waves is the next topic. If you have an alternating current, it creates electromagnetic waves. Radios are electromagnetic waves. My cell phone uses electromagnetic waves, waves to communicate. If you have a cool phone charger system, you charge your phone through electromagnetic waves. You put your little phone on, just set it flat on a surface that's emitting electromagnetic waves that are picked up by antenna in the phone and used to charge the battery. How many people have that? Anyone? You can get a cover for an iPhone to do it, but it's not built into the iPhone. It is built into the latest Samsung telephones. Okay, so there was a farmer had these high voltage lines going through his property, and he was all, hey, I learned a little physics. Those alternating currents in the high voltage line are going to create electromagnetic waves. They're going to be reasonably strong because it's pretty high current still. And so he put a little antenna below the power lines and used that to power his house. Genius! But unfortunately, that's considered theft. You know, he was thinking, hey, it's going through the air. Why can't I just use an antenna to pick up what's going through the air? But it was considered theft because a lot of the power in those waves is actually, it collapses and it comes back to the wire. But of course, if you use an intent to collect it, then it does go back to the wire. And so the efficiency of transmission drops. The efficiency of transmission didn't drop. I don't see how they could actually. I, I don't see how they could. I mean, people will sue you for copying your DVDs that you own. So some people are green enough. They still would. OK. Now we're going to talk about waves, and specifically sound. Sound. It's kind of a fun thing in physics. I didn't bring out all my demonstrations today. For lab, we'll be working with sound, I believe, and, and we'll have more demonstrations on Tuesday with sound where I bring out my little plunky string instruments. So waves are in a lot of things in nature, not just sound. Oh my goodness, I set out my slinky on my desk and I forgot to bring it in. I have to get my slinky. You can all sing in, you know, go downstairs, go to repairs, and not enough. You guys are okay. I got my slinky. So we can talk about waves, we have to have the slinky to talk about the waves, right? Light is a wave. Quantum physics is about waves. We have waves in lots of things we use. So we're going to start learning about those. Gravity waves. Everybody heard of gravity waves? This semester, right? Mm -hmm. The first discovery this semester. So even that we can now say we have evidence for it. Anybody recognize this beautiful locale? No? I helped build this barn. My house when I grew up was, uh-oh, <laughs> my brain went yellow on me. My house when I grew up was right about here. That's Monterey Bay Academy. True story, my sister, who of course grew up in the same house as me, when she was in medical school, 
she had a classmate who said, no, MBA doesn't have a beach. I mean, they live close to the beach, they can take a bus to the beach, but they don't live on the beach. Just for proof, yes, we are on the beach. Um, they own the beach from where this hits the beach to over about here. Okay, so why do I have this picture? Because water waves are another example of a wave. And so talk about a key thing of a wave. Waves transmit energy. Energy goes through a wave. If you look at the water wave, Water does move, right? I mean, water is coming up on shore. But if you are out there in the water, how many people have played around in waves? Okay, good. A higher number. Since we are as far away from waves as you can get in the United States, I have to ask rather than assuming. So if you're out there playing in waves, you're swimming, not touching the ground, a wave comes toward you, so the wave comes in this direction. What direction do you move as the wave is approaching? You, you move toward it. So as the wave is coming in, you move toward it. Now when the wave gets to you, assuming of course that you float, what do you do? You move up. After the wave passes, of course you come back down, and then what direction do you go? You go the same direction the wave was going. So if you were to plot your motion for that wave, which is the same as the motion of the water molecules. As the wave came, you went this way, then you went up, and then you went down and back. And so you basically do a loop. So the water is basically doing loops. The water is not traveling into shore. It's more like a chain reaction to make the wave travel into shore, and the water is just doing the loop. So the energy is being transmitted basically by a chain reaction type event, not by things going all the way. So it's not like you shoot a gun and the bullet goes and hits the wall. You know, the bullet went from here to there and delivered the energy. With a wave, well, like a sound wave. Right now I'm speaking. When I speak, have you thought about what's happening? No. What do you think is going on when I speak? Okay, I have air coming out of my lungs, and I have little flaps of skin that go blah, 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 blah. And so out of my mouth comes pulses of air. What happens to that air when it comes out of my mouth? Well, First thing it's going to do is hit another molecule, right? Because there's a lot of molecules around us. And when it hits a molecule, you have a collision, and you transfer momentum and energy. And then so that, mo that molecule starts moving, and this one slows down. Then it has a collision, and we have chain reactions that are taking those pulses out to everybody. So when you're hearing my voice, you are not having the molecules that came out of my mouth going into your ears. It's a chain reaction that carried the energy to you. So that's what waves are doing. Now we're going to talk about two different types of waves. Transverse and longitudinal waves. Come on, transverse and longitudinal. And the slinky, remember I had to go get the slinky, is a good way to demonstrate these, as is the applet on the computer. So first, I, I'm sorry, Rachel. I don't want to just sit here and I'll go to the next slide. Instead of, instead of doing it on that one and then changing. So I'm going to demonstrate wave. So I'm going to have Michaela be my helper by holding the end of this. Okay, so she's holding one end, I'm holding the other. Now I can make waves two ways. I go like this and make it oscillate between us. We have what we call a standing wave right now. It's standing because it looks like there's nothing happening. It's just going up and down and nothing going side to side. What's really happening is there's a wave going that way and a wave going this way, and they're adding up to get us down. So I could also make it go like this. You know. That we call a transverse wave. Transverse because the motion of the material, the medium, 
was perpendicular to the direction the wave was traveling. We could also make what we call a longitudinal wave. So I'm going to take this, I'm going to pull this back and let go. You saw the wave go to Michaela. You see it still going back and forth, back and forth. This was more of the chain reaction you expect. We call this a longitudinal wave when the, the motion of the medium was in the same direction that the wave was traveling. So right, the slinky is great for this because you can demonstrate those two basic types. You can look up there at the picture now and see, oh, yes, they probably did a better job than Richard and Michaela did. But we did the same thing. So longitudinal, the particles are moving this direction, and the velocity is that direction. They're parallel. Transverse, the particles are moving this direction, but the wave is that. So perpendicular. Now, also, we should be aware we can have a pulse or a continuous wave. A pulse would be something like when I just pulled back and let go. You had a pulse that went down to one end and then came back to the other. I could have done a continuous wave. Come back to Michaela. I could have done a continuous longitudinal wave if I just went like this. Right there, I'm making a continuous wave. So it's basically about the duration that makes the difference in the two. So they're both waves. Now I want to look at waves with an animation here, get a little more detail. So in this animation, we see longitudinal waves continuing to move. Notice the markers on the bottom one. You have a marker that's pointing to the single particle, and you see it oscillating back and forth, back and forth. It's not traveling the length of the tube. But the wave, it has these regions that we call compressions, where the particles are close together, regions where we have rarefactions, where the particles are more rare, rarefaction, they're farther apart. And those compressions and rarefactions are just continually traveling down the tube. And this is what a sound wave actually is like. So if you, you know, play the trumpet, this is what's going on inside of that trumpet. So that's longitudinal waves. But that's not the only kind. So here's transverse wave don't have a nicely marked red molecule to see, but if you just keep your eye on a molecule, you see the molecule is just moving up and down, while the wave is traveling horizontally. So that's transverse. The motion of the molecule is perpendicular to the velocity versus, versus in the longitudinal, the motion of the particle was parallel to the velocity. But there are combinations of those. Here's what the water wave looks like. You can see what I was describing if you're playing in the surf. That yellow dot goes in toward the wave as it comes, follows it afterward, and ends up doing a loop. That loop is actually just a combination of a longitudinal wave and a transverse wave. The transverse accounts for the up and down motion. The longitudinal accounts for the side to side motion. So water waves are a hybrid wave. They're both longitudinal and transverse. Earthquakes. How many people have lived through an earthquake? <laughs> lived through. Obviously, we've all not died in an earthquake. You know, when I <clears throat> came to America, I never felt an earthquake. But started feeling them pretty quickly and became very used to them. And when earthquakes happen, first of all, be aware that earthquakes aren't really all that dangerous unless you live in a building or in a building, a structure that's not built to withstand it. They're building a new, a new hospital, essentially, Loma University, because the old one is seismically not up to standard for a hospital. You can't stay overnight. You can have patients in You just can't have them overnight. Because I suppose the bad earthquakes happen at nighttime. Not true. So this new 
um, hospitals being built with all of the current seismic things to make it safe in an earthquake. So it's built on rollers with springs. So if an earthquake comes and shakes it side to side, the building will stay fixed while the earth shakes side to side. So if you are standing on the ground, it'll look like the building is going like this. But in reality, the building is staying still and the ground is going like this. But of course, earthquakes have up and down motion possible too. So they also have some springs and things so it can also stay stationary vertically while the earth goes up and down. Now, all of that sounds great until you think, but wait, now, so I'm in this building and the building is essentially floating, right? Because it could go side to side, it could go up and down. It makes things a little more interesting. Well, for surface waves, you have a couple different types of waves. Here's a Rayleigh wave. Now, the Rayleigh wave, when you look at this, notice it looks a lot like a water wave in that the particle is doing a circle, right? But the particle is actually going the opposite direction. Right, this one here is a counterclockwise circle, whereas the water wave, oops. It was a clockwise circle. If you go down lower in the Rayleigh wave, it is a clockwise circle. So the Rayleigh wave is a unique, different combination of transverse and longitudinal waves that occurs in some surface earthquake waves. Another type, okay, this doesn't have the other types of earthquake waves. You can also have earthquake waves where the ground moves side to side, Lots of different types of earthquake waves that are made by combining longitude and transverse waves. So earthquakes is another big thing for waves. Because of time, I'm not going to talk about earthquake waves. And instead, I'm going to move forward with my lecture. With waves, we talk about the period. The period is the time for something to repeat. So the time for this class to repeat, we meet every two days, well, three days a week. So the period is the time between something reoccurring. Frequency, on the other hand, is the number of times something occurs, or the number of instances per unit time. And so it turns out the relationship between frequency and period is very, very simple. Frequency is 1 divided by period. So let's take the... Uh, the day. What is the period for a day? 24 hours. So for one day, we use the symbol T, capital T for time, is equal to 24 hours. So that means the frequency It's one day per 24 hours. Right, it's a very simple transformation from one to the other. So we talk about frequency and wavelength, or excuse me, frequency and period. If you know one, you automatically know the other because they have such a simple relationship. And then we talk about the wavelength. The wavelength is the distance before the wave repeats. So you have a wave, let's say it's a sinusoidal wave, it's going like this. It repeats in that distance. And so we call that distance the wavelength, and we have the symbol lambda. That's the wavelength. Now notice I drew the wavelength from peak to peak. That is, of course, correct, but it's not the only option. I could have gone from here to here. That's also the wavelength. Or I could have chosen from here to, how far do I have to go from that point? Okay, I have to go to the next place where I have the same slope and value. So you can go from any place to where it repeats, but you have to be careful. You can't go from zero to zero with one being downslope and one being upslope. And by the nature of speed, 
Speed is distance over time. Well, the wavelength is the distance for one cycle. The period is the time for one cycle. So the wavelength divided by the period has to be the speed. Or, since period is 1 over frequency, the wave times, wavelength times the frequency is the speed. Okay, I am out of time. I'll see you for lab this afternoon.